Super Soul Seekers. Got another good one for you today. Mm, favorite teacher, Gary Zukov. Now, the first time Gary and I discussed relationships on The Oprah Show, he said some things that were very surprising to a lot of people. He talked about spiritual partnership, which I never forgot the definition, a partnership between equals for the purpose of spiritual growth. Mm. Are you in one of those spiritual partnerships or one of those other kind? That's where Gary says you'll find the real passion, the real intimacy, and that's really what most people say they want in their marriages and relationships, a real deal soulmate. Well, Gary really got people thinking when he said that romance, the roses, the champagne, the horse-drawn garages, all of it, just an illusion and has no basis in reality. Don't we know that? Yes, even with The Bachelor and Bachelorette. All the things that little girls grow up fantasizing about are exactly that. They are fantasies. And Gary says those fantasies actually prevent people from having fulfilling, meaningful relationships. Mm hmm This is a good one. Get ready for Romantic Love 101 with Gary Zukov. Change the way you think about your own relationship. Maybe. I think a lot of people have the wrong perception or, uh, or and conception of what marriage is and partnership is because they think you're supposed to marry and be happy ever after and that person's supposed to take care of you and everything's supposed to be wonderful. That's the general idea. Yes, there is a difference between marriage and spiritual partnership. Many marriages are spiritual partnerships. Many marriages are spiritual partnerships. And in fact, I will suggest to you that only those marriages that have the energy of spiritual partnership, which is partnership between equals for the purpose of spiritual growth, will survive, mm -hmm. will be vibrant and meaningful and worthy of your precious time on this earth. So those are the ones that last? Those are the ones that last. Okay, this is Patricia and Bill. When they first met, they felt instinctively that they were soulmates. But after four years of marriage, Patricia says she is miserable because there is no intimacy left in their relationship. And now, like so many other couples, they are trying to understand how they have become so disconnected. Take a look. We met over the 4th of July weekend at the Jersey Shore, and I immediately liked him. I never was able to connect with anyone that way. And she, um, she made me laugh. She was very brilliant. I knew I was going to spend the rest of my life with him. He was like the other half of me. It was perfect. You know, it's what you hope for. In our beginning of our relationship, it was wonderful. It was magical. So when we had our first child, we probably became quite disconnected then. I was so passionately in love with this man, I could barely keep my hands off of him. And then, now all of a sudden, I'm a leper. Well, what is it? Am I getting fat? OK. I put on some weight. I'm pregnant. Probably for the past four years, we had had no sex life. Basically, it's been non-existent. I never lost a physical attraction to Pat. Even when she was pregnant, she was still very beautiful to me. I asked him if he was having an affair. I've never had any thoughts of having any relationship with anyone else, never. He was the best guy that I ever knew. And he loved me. And I knew it. I felt it. It was the one thing I was sure of, and now I don't know. There is nothing painful about this for me. I'm content. I miss him. I miss who he was. I miss what we had. And what do you think happened? I haven't a clue. I don't know. I, I have tried so many times to get him to talk to me, to... Ooh. What have I done? What is it? I thought I was fat. Go on a diet, lose weight. I smoke. I thought it must be, I, he, I, I have smoker's breath. He can't stand that. So I quit smoking for six or seven weeks. Nothing. I mean, <laughs> well, not forever. It wasn't working. So I went back. Mm -hmm. um, whatever I try, I've screamed at him. I've shouted at him. I've sat down and talked to him. I just. What do you think happened? I think we got caught up in uh, everyday life, the things that we have to do in life and we stopped looking at each other. What do you want to say, Gare? The first thing I want to say is that I'm not a, a marriage counselor and I'm not here to tell you or anyone else what to do. 
but to share a perspective that I hope will be valuable for you. A spiritual partnership, whether it's in a marriage or outside of a marriage, requires communication. It requires becoming aware of everything that you are feeling and learning how to share it in a way that maintains your integrity and is also considerate of the people or person that you are talking to. Because words can do so much damage or so much healing, especially when you're feeling angry or upset or vulnerable. Spiritual growth doesn't mean an otherworldly experience. It means getting to know who I am. It means getting to know what my fears are. It means getting to know what my intentions are when I interact with my spiritual partners or anyone else. Is my intention to control or to manipulate another person? Or is my intention to grow myself and to support another person in the kindest and most considerate way that I can? Is my intention to impose myself? Or is my intention to learn patience when I feel impatient? Is my intention to become compassionate when I feel angry? And at the same time, to learn why I am feeling angry and why I'm feeling impatient so that I can change that because it's too painful Because one of me. the things you said in the tape is you wanted, to, you wanted the, your old guy back. You wanted it to be the way it was. Yeah. Well, it can't be the way it was because look at what's happened in terms of, you know, you, when you first met, you didn't have children, you didn't have this life. Life is about growing on to the next level. So part of what's going on as what you're talking about, look inside yourself, you're wanting him to be what was when what was isn't anymore. But I don't understand how we got from there to where we are now. Well, see, interesting enough that what Gary is also saying, I think, is a lot of, and women do this, I did this for years myself, you, you're looking outside yourself for somebody to f fill and feed what that person can't do. He can only do and be what he is because he's growing for he's growing himself for himself. Right. And you're trying to do the same thing. So if you're looking for him to fill up that hole, to not make you feel lonely, to not make you feel whatever it is you're feeling, mm -hmm. he can't do that. But you can. So how does that get him to I, take the garbage out? I how does that get him to take the garbage out? <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's get down to basics yeah. here. <laughs> oh, that would hurt. Sorry. <laughs> that would alleviate a lot of frustration. <laughs> I want to suggest to you, I, I think I know how you got from where you were to here. And I don't mean to be presumptuous because I don't know the details of your life. I also want to suggest that what, where you were was not as real as it may have seemed. And that when you meet somebody and they seem to be the answer to your problems, the answer to your life, in fact, the completion of everything that you want to be, you are actually seeing that, but you're seeing it in the wrong place. You're seeing it in someone else. Instead of looking at what is missing in you, you put it out on someone else. And then as you get to know each other over the days and the weeks and the months and the years, you begin to realize this is not that person. And right. it has never been that person. And then you are left with a very powerful place to be. What are you going to do now? No, you're left with yourself. Yeah. <laughs> you are so left you... with yourself. And what are you going to do now? Yes. What are you going to do now, both of you? Because that person you saw, you thought when, they, when she, she, you see that person, they have everything, everything that makes you feel whole. I think somebody even said that in the tape. And then when you realize they're not that, then that's when you feel the missing, your missing self. That's right. Well, what about when a person that you meet behaves in a certain way and then just doesn't anymore. Because they're playing that game, too. I'll buy that. Yeah. <laughs> well, everybody has a show face yeah, that you I'm put on. Saying, uh, uh, yeah, isn't that true, Gary? Mm -hmm. you're, they're playing that game. When you first meet, it's romance, and he's sending you flowers, and it's a wonderful, lovely thing. Be cautious of that. <laughs> Use it as a flag. Use it as a flag to indicate to yourself that you are feeling powerless and looking for someone else to make you feel powerful and whole and complete. And that will not work. That romantic stage of infatuation won't work because you can't maintain that illusion no, that long years, at yeah. close range. But when you come to close range, if you can then begin to see where your frustrations are, you can begin to grow in a genuine way not by blaming the other person or trying to make the other person what you want the other person to be. That's reaching outward. 
but by looking inward to see what is so painful about this situation now. Why am I in genuine pain or anger? Beneath the anger will be because pain. Because he is, he is now not behaving the way he used to behave. That's right. It appears as though he's broken an agreement. Yeah, I'll but, say. I mean, he, it, was, it, was the way, it was the way we were when we were together. He was always, I was always first in his mind. I knew it and I felt it. Everything he did was with me in mind. The way he approached me, the way he talked to me. He always thought of me first. Sometimes people who need to feel secure in themselves uh, do that by trying to please other people continually. Mm -hmm. And to yeah, be on the receiving the end of a pleasing pattern of behavior can be very delightful it at was. first. <laughs> it was. Oh, but right, you are, so oh my God. You, 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 the, the idea of asking people to be cautious when they get that giddy, I am so happy, jump over the moon, romantic feeling. Right, that's uh, very easy to grab a hold of. Yeah, well, because that's what everybody is looking for. That's what everybody is looking for. So you got your work cut out for you, buddy, trying yeah. to get people to see something else. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, that's what everybody's looking for. And that's what she, and that's what, when it, when this happens, as anybody who's been married for a long time tells you, this happens when reality sets in and that romantic giddy thing is gone and he, and he is, you are no longer the first priority in his day. Um, oh, you feel a loss of that because that's why really a lot of people are married because of that feeling. That's what we're on this show to discuss. <laughs> <laughs> exactly that. So perhaps you're in a relationship that isn't working as well as it used to. Spark is long gone. You're feeling disconnected from the person you chose to spend your life with. Here's the good news. Gary Zukov says it is possible to reconnect with your partner in a much deeper meaningful way by making one pledge, committing yourself to spiritual growth as individuals and as partners. And that commitment can offer you new direction and new hope. It might just show you what it really means to be a soulmate. Watch this. This is Sue and her husband, John. They have just gone through a really difficult separation and uh, have been back together now for only three weeks. And now they are trying to reconnect after 12 very difficult years. Take a, take a brief look. I am a 36-year-old mother of four boys. I married right out of college because the perception of life was too scary and I wanted security. We had kids right away. They brought me the unconditional love that I felt no one ever gave to me. And my marriage took a back seat to the children. On the outside, it appeared as though I had everything in life but a small voice kept sending me the same message. I am empty, lonely, and spiritually disconnected. In the beginning, I thought Sue and I were soulmates, but as things changed over the years, I lost my identity because I would do anything to make Sue happy. During our recent separation, we experienced a very dark time, but out of that darkness came clarity. I started to let go of my expectations and disappointments about my marriage and opened my soul. We have a lot of work to do, but John and I have realized that we have to work on ourselves first in order to become whole. Big key there, uh, because when you're ever you're looking outside yourself, you're looking in the wrong place. Is that true? That is true. It's not it, that you're looking in the wrong place, but you're looking in a place that is not going to be able to heal in you the dynamics that are creating the pain and loneliness in your life. Sue says when she let go of her anxiety about her marriage, which was feeling like what? Um, I think I was very scared because I came into the marriage with a lot of baggage or stuff, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And um, John didn't know that stuff. He knew what he married. And as I started looking at it, um, I didn't know if he was going to love me, mm -hmm. if he was going to want to be with me. Because I'm um, looking at it, I'm changing. I'm letting go of some of that stuff that just didn't feel right. Well, when she began to let go of some of it, she felt more confident, mm -hmm. but she also felt she was leaving her husband, John, behind. I did. I felt like here I am doing all this growing and feeling, and, and he wasn't. That was my perception. So you had allowed her, quote, control in the marriage, so to speak. 
-hmm. Yes, uh, just uh, not really uh, knowing who I was and just wanting the people please or, or please Sue and, and make sure all her needs were met, mm -hmm. sacrificing my needs. And uh, that was throughout our 12 years of marriage was just I lost myself. Didn't really know who John was. She even asked me that. She goes, who is John? And I couldn't answer that. But really? I didn't want that. I wanted to find out who I am. Who am I? What am I bringing into this marriage? And then John would be like trying to fix me and make me happy. And I wanted him to find out who he is. I mean, if I don't come as an I am and he's not an I am, how can we be a we are? We just. We That's could... big. That's really big. I'll be waiting on your book. Thank that's really you. big. <laughs> I'm gonna write one. I am, I am, we are. Yeah. That's really, that's it, really big though. It was, and it's like... And I think a lot of people can relate to that. Yeah. Can you see the elements of spiritual partnership in this discussion? Self-responsibility, communication with integrity, being responsible for deciding to indulge in anger or deciding to challenge it and to communicate another way. I have never compromised myself in my spiritual partnership with my spiritual partner, Linda Francis. As she has grown into her power, she would not tolerate aspects of me, and I had to change those aspects of me, like being controlling mm -hmm. and right all the time, because... <laughs> <laughs> because I wanted my relationship with Linda, but I didn't sacrifice who I needed to be for a relationship, I knew that what I needed to do to keep our relationship healthy was what I needed to do to become all that I wanted to be. Right. And I could have... Yeah. I had to do the same thing. I had to give up being right all the time. So even when I am right, I just keep it to myself now. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's too big. <laughs> Because same thing was I want to be in the relationship and I wanted to work and I realized that I had some control issues also. But Gary was very controlling. Uh, yes, yes, he was very controlling. Mm -hmm. But the thing that was really wonderful is that I realized that even when he was controlling, he was wanting to shift things. And so he asked me to tell him, you know, I, and I would say what was going on yeah. if if that's what he wanted. He told me he wanted to grow spiritually. He did not want to be controlling. And so we and would so talk about him out it, what would it. happen, absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I see you guys all the time. You go out to dinner with them. They're asking, I mean, what do you want, beloved? What do you want, beloved? What do you... <laughs> I mean, you all have a huge, I mean, you all communicate more than the average couple, I would think. <laughs> do you not? Yes, we do. Because you're so. constantly asked, what are you really feeling? Mm -hmm. uh, are you, you know, what's beneath this? Right. Thank you, Oprah, for acknowledging Linda and me to be as loving and conscious toward each other as we strive to be. But we were a typical couple. I was controlling and, and needing to be right, but I have another word for that now. What? Frightened. Yeah. yeah. I was frightened. Good. And Linda was a person who uh, yeah. pleased a lot and distorted her life to please others. And the word, my more aware word for that is the same, frightened. And so her fear and my fear interlocked perfectly. I needed someone to treat me as a king, and she needed someone to treat as a king. Mm -hmm. And as we grew, we grew into ever better things. And a spiritual partnership will bring out between the spiritual partners mm -hmm. all of the obstacles in both mm -hmm. or more that stand between them and their fullest potential. Absolutely. So it's not, do that's, not. That, oh, I'm so excited. Go ahead. I'm not going to. That's it. <laughs> Go ahead. That's it. So don't think that when deep and difficult issues come up that your spiritual partnership isn't working. Is it... no longer your soulmate. That's what people think. Exactly. Thought you were my soulmate. Guess you're not because we're having problems. Right. Yeah. It is. <laughs> well, you That's think it. you're right back to where you were. Yeah. That's it. When those problems emerge, they are not problems. They are opportunities. Mm -hmm. They are opportunities Ooh, for you see, to look. Look at how many you have. Mm -hmm. Opportunities. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>key differences between marriage and spiritual partnership is that just because you found your spiritual partner doesn't mean that you're going to be together forever. Mm, that's key. The partnership lasts only as long as there's spiritual growth. That's what defines it. A partnership between equals for the purpose of spiritual growth. Interesting.
So why do you say, Gary, that finding your spiritual partner may not mean you'll be together for life? Because spiritual partners only stay together as long as they grow together. But understand this clearly. This is not a license for sexual or emotional or psychological promiscuity. That prevents spiritual partnership. The bond between spiritual partners is as deep and as meaningful as the commitment between marriage partners, but for significantly different reasons. It is for spiritual growth. So do not think that when you're in a spiritual partnership, things won't get rough. They will get rough, and that will not break up a spiritual partnership. They may get rough and stay rough for a fairly long time, or even a very long time. That will not break up a spiritual partnership. But the intention on the part of one or both of the spiritual partners not to grow anymore will. This is a critical distinction. When you are in difficult interactions with your spiritual partner, if you have the intention to grow, that means learn about yourself, not teach the other person what's wrong about him or her. And the other person has the same orientation, a determination to grow, to use this moment, perhaps of intense pain, or what appears to be mutual insanity, to grow. That is what your spiritual partnership is for. That is why spiritual partners look carefully at the people they select to be spiritual partners, because they know they will enter these moments together, as well as moments of intense joy and fulfillment and exhilaration. This is Jill and her husband, David. Each had been married before they met, and both say today they think about marriage in a completely different way than they did the first time around, which is basically the idea that we're trying to get across to everybody today. I mean, everybody asks me all the time, this is the number one question I get that I cannot stand, why aren't you married? But it's because I look at marriage in a different way. I do look at it as a, as a, as a spiritual partnership connection. I think if you have that, that is the most important thing. And now both of you have been married. Yes. And now you look at marriage in a different way. Take a look. I first married when I was 19 and thought I would have a spiritual marriage because we were both the same religion. We had three children, and the marriage lasted 13 years because we were committed to our church. But I was always lonely, and we were distant from each other. By the time we went our separate ways, I felt spiritually empty. I was married to my first wife for 15 years before the relationship started to unravel. My marriage to Jill is very different. We rely on each other, but I don't depend on her for my self-esteem. And I don't rely on David to complete me and make me happy. When problems do come up, I've learned to look at myself before blaming him for how I feel. Jill gives me the freedom to be who I am. It is safe to be me with all my flaws. I used to think marriage was a commitment I had to keep. Now I make the choice every day to love Jill. That is so huge. I could cry for you. Because <laughs> isn't that the key? Jill gives me the freedom to be who I am. That's the key. And why are you crying, Jill? I feel so grateful. I feel, I feel so much compassion mm -hmm. for your pain, mm -hmm. because I felt that. Mm -hmm. And I feel so grateful for my own pain mm -hmm. and for the things that have brought me, the experiences in my life that have brought me to this, to this point. So you know what Gary speaks of when he talks about spiritual partnership. I feel it. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you feel it. I do. Yeah. Very deeply, and I, I... And I think it's so interesting. That's why we loved your story, because you thought you had a spiritual partnership because you were married to somebody who was in the church. I really searched for compatibility in, in religion. Mm -hmm. and, and I feel like I, I really had that with my first husband. And... I appreciated it, and we have three beautiful children together, but it wasn't the kind of um, deeply spiritual relationship that Gary speaks of. You said, I think to the producers, you felt that marriage, yes. as it is today, without a spiritual partnership is obsolete. When I first read that in Gary's book, it was, seemed to me a shocking statement, um, one that I just took a little bit of time to rather than say, well, what is that? I really internalized it. And um, the more I think about it, the more I think it's really true. 
I think that um, to have the deep connection that feels so satisfying where you're, you're working together to heal each other and to, and to learn to love everyone else in, in your life more, uh, it, it has to be. It has, it has to be different. And it's changing, Gary. You think it's really changing? Yes, I know it's changing. And I'm very grateful for to have you two who are married and in the energy of spiritual partnership. This is important to me. This is not marriage bashing. It's simply, it's simply illuminating a new evolutionary dynamic, a bond between couples. Well, I think you said it earlier in that if you don't have it, whether, regardless of whether you call it spiritual partnership or whether you call it you know, communication in relationship, whatever you call it, if you don't have it, then your marriage will not survive. Your marriage will not survive in a way that allows you to grow, to be who you are, to fulfill yourself. Mm -hmm. We'll be right back. So the conversation you're about to see is one of my favorites. It may not have been what the women in the audience wanted to hear, but Gary Zukov spoke the truth, honey, when he debunked one of the most memorable romantic movie moments ever. Remember Jerry Maguire when Jerry, Tom Cruise, my friend, professes his love to Renee Zellweger and says, you complete me? Well, who doesn't remember that? That's when all the women in the theater start getting all like, I want a man like that, thinking how much they'd love somebody to say that to them. Well, that one special person who is meant to complete them, hmm, wonder who that is. It's one of the most romantic scenes ever and has, Gary has been trying to tell us, romance is nothing but an illusion. There's only one person who can complete you. By romantic attraction, what I'm talking about is the feeling that someone else is the answer to your life. Mm -hmm. Not just for a night, not just for a moment, but that this is the person who can complete you. Oh, yeah, like the line in Je Jerry Maguire. You know that line in Jerry Maguire? Where, That's where right. either he says or she says, you complete me. And the whole audience goes, oh, oh yes. <laughs> because, you know, women are thinking, I wish my husband would say that to me, you know? Yes, That's so right. th that's exactly what you're talking about. That is romantic attraction. And it's often called romantic love, but it has nothing to do with love. Love is a much more powerful, deep, fulfilling experience, and it doesn't wear off. Okay, so let's make this point, too. So when you say romantic love doesn't last, and anybody here who's ever been in love knows that that does not last, correct? And that it, the only way it does last is that it, it has the ability to move on to something deeper. That's right. right. This is important to understand. So for this larger context, think of it this way. Think of it in terms of your being in a university. Now, you can shorten that to universe. Mm -hmm. Then think that in this university, you on, are on a particular campus. Correct. We can call that the Earth School. Gotcha. Now, one of those classes in the Earth School is called, or we can call it, romantic love. Okay, that's a class. That is one class in the Earth School. It's a very popular class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of people sign up for it. You must get lots of points for that. <laughs> Actually, what happens is romantic love is just one part of one class. Most people take the first semester of the class and then they start it over again. Here's how it happens. You feel that powerful sensation of euphoria, of well-being, of uh, finding someone that is going to complete your life. And you and call you up your excited. girlfriend and say, ooh, girl, I have met him. That's right. Yeah. It is a high. It's a high. It's very similar to... He has got a job and a Mercedes. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, I'm with you, girl. Go ahead. That's right. Yeah. Now, that doesn't last. Sooner or later, that wears off, and you begin to feel that maybe you've done something wrong, or maybe you picked the wrong man. Or, or he's not doing what you want him to. He, no, he won't be doing what you want him to. When, that's, uh, when, when, okay. when that phase is reached, uh -huh. that's part of the transition. When, when you begin to realize that the person you're with is not the person that you thought you were with. And that's what I mean when I say this experience of romantic love is not real. It doesn't mean that you're not having these experiences. It means that eventually you begin to see more clearly that the person you are with is not going to rescue you, is not going to be the knight, 
is not going to be your savior and is not going to complete you because he's got a temper perhaps or because perhaps he won't express himself and he clams up, perhaps because he's getting a little bald and you didn't notice that before, <laughs> perhaps because he's uh, got feelings of vulnerability or fear or perhaps because he won't look at his vulnerabilities and fear. And the same thing happens with men, by the way. There's two parts to this. So, or there's two sides to this interaction. But no matter which side you're playing, sooner or later you begin to think, I've made a mistake. This isn't the right person. Well, no better example of this just that just this week on a on a Phil McGraw show, the woman, you all saw that show, where the woman is n nagging her husband and she had a whole list of things, including the way she wanted her pants folded, how he was supposed to have sex, what he was, and the fact that he got up and left the table and left her sitting at the table because in her mind, she had this idea of what a husband is supposed to do and be, and he was not fulfilling that little, that little fantasy. Exactly. And that's where most people go back and start the class over again. Now, if you're the lever, then you feel that you've picked the wrong person, and you should have picked someone else, and that euphoric experience is gone, so you go back to the class, which means you start to look for someone else with whom you can have this high experience again. But that high experience will end in the same way the first and the second and the third and the fourth and so on did. Because? It, because eventually you will s begin to see the person that you are with in a more real way, in a more accurate way. You know what people often say? I, I hear them say this all the time. I found my soulmate. Yes. I hear them say that too. You have many soulmates. <laughs> and I know that's your answer, is that we're all soulmates. We are all soulmates because everyone that is on this particular campus in the universe or this university is a soul. Now the question is, in this particular class, you experiment with one way of relating with one of your soulmates. Yeah. You are in the class with the person that you are having this romantic love affair with. You two are classmates. Yeah. Before, you have been looking at the person who is in your life as someone who is charming, warm, intelligent, competent, sexual, gregarious. And can um, fulfill your needs. Whatever it is that yeah. you want in your life. Yeah. Actually, those are the parts of yourself that you are not cultivating. Correct. Instead, you are looking for someone else, else to bring to those to parts you. into your life. Ooh. Ooh, we got that, Gary. We got that. So if you're looking for somebody to complete you, if you are looking for the perfect mate to complete you, Gary says, you are never truly going to feel whole trying to find it in somebody else. Okay? Everybody with me on that? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's some people who tried and know. Okay, last season on another show with Gary, there was a young woman named Amber who stood up and uh, revealed mixed feelings. I think this was after the show. We were just sitting around talking to the audience. She stood up and revealed mixed feelings about her upcoming wedding. And what she said resonated with a lot of you because we received lots of your emails after uh, this. Take a look. I'm getting married March 18th, and I'm just like... It, it just don't feel like everything's in line. And I thought it was. And it wasn't. <laughs> See, I and it's like, I, I mean, I spent, yesterday I went to try on my dress and I bawled in front of the dress shop for half an hour because nobody was with me. And all of a sudden I was, when you guys started talking, I'm like, why was I crying? Why was I so upset no one was with me? I should be just happy that I was there. Why are you getting married? Because <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> That's horrible. Well, this is Vicki. She was one of the many women who wrote in after seeing that show and says that Amber's story, Amber is now married and says everything's really fine, uh, reminded her, though, of how she felt a few years ago when she, too, was engaged. Look at this. I was raised to believe that a woman needed to be taken care of by a man. That was my whole belief concept. You know, the white picket fence, two cars, middle class family. That's kind of what I expected from a relationship. I met my ex-fiance in high school and we started dating soon after that. And uh, it was in our ninth year of the relationship that we became engaged. 
It was almost like my fairy tale had come true. We were the perfect couple, you know? Everyone would look at us and say, you're so perfect together. I knew even back then that he wasn't my soulmate. I desperately wanted to believe that he was the man I was gonna spend the rest of my life with, simply because I needed to believe in that fantasy of this is our perfect life together. I had to have a fantasy wedding. I mean, it was something that, um, that you just do. I went looking for wedding dresses. I found my, my dream gown. We booked a, a, a huge hall, a beautiful hall, 280 odd guests. Probably about six months into the engagement, I started to get really sick. I couldn't understand what was going, going on with my body. I was rushed to the hospital. Uh, numerous doctors had examined me. Nobody could find anything wrong. I woke up one day and that was it. Something was terribly wrong. When I had gone to bed that night and meditated, I had asked, am I meant to marry this man? What is going on? Please tell me. I was awoken at 6 a.m. With, with a beautiful and peaceful dream. I know to this day it was my grandmother. I remember her presence and I remember her acceptance and I knew the feeling of knowingness. And when I woke up, I had my answer and the answer was no. I could not go through with this wedding. I felt so liberated at that moment. Immediately after I ended the engagement, um, my life took a turn for the better. Had I gone through with this wedding, I would be living a lie. I believe that God, when he closes one door, another one opens. When the door was closed on this relationship, I was blessed and given the opportunity to open a spiritual relationship with myself. I always had that soulmate fantasy that, oh, somebody will complete me. But I'm realizing that, that the completeness can only come within. I have to be able to complete myself. Well, if no other message gets across today, I hope that one does, that you, ha you only complete you. And that beginning a spiritual relationship with yourself is, is, the, is the path to self-awareness. We'll be right back. Gary Zukov says, romantic love, just a drug. Hmm. A lot of people like being drugged. It produces really euphoria, energy, vitality. You get a high. But when that thing wears off, everything you felt before you took the drug comes right back. Here's the key, and this is what Gary really wants us to take away from this discussion. When the romance goes away, it is not a tragedy, it's an opportunity because that's when the real growth, spiritual growth, can happen. When you see the person that you believe is completing you, look at that person and list what it is that you feel is completing you in that person. You might say, for example, she's beautiful, he's competent, uh, she's gregarious, she loves people, she's open, she has a warm heart, he's a... Uh, he understands me. He understands me. All of those things are things that you have the capability of inside yourself. But instead of cultivating those things in yourself, instead of doing that inner work, which begins with considering the possibility that you really do have those characteristics yourself, you are instead reaching outward to find someone in the world who will bring all of that into your life and make you feel that way. That's the knight on the horse. That's Mr. Right. Oh, oh so That's I got Ms. it. Perfect. I got it. I got it. I know what the answer to solving this is then. So if you're looking for that in your life, if you're looking for that, you make a list for yourself of all the things that you want in Ms. Right or Mr. Right, and then you start to cultivate from that list those things in yourself. Yes. Yes, you can do it that way exactly. And if you wait a little bit too long and you find yourself in this romantic love class yeah. with another person, it's not too late. Write down all of the things that you love so much about the person who is, you think, completing you. Those are the things that you can cultivate in yourself. Because your point is the other person can never give that to you. Correct. Correct. I hope that hearing Gary's perspective on love and romance has really kind of opened your eyes to think about spiritual partnership, a partnership between equals, you can't have spiritual partnership if one person wants one thing and you want something else and they're not willing to grow. It's a partnership between equals for the purpose of spiritual growth. Hope it's helped you think about how you can take on some of the ideas you've heard today and take your relationship to higher ground. 
Thanks for watching the Best of the Oprah Show on Super Soul Sunday.